Hello and welcome to the I3 lecture series hosted by the Masters in Digital Photography program at the School of Visual Arts. We're thrilled to have photographer John Trotter as tonight's guest speaker. A native of Missouri, John worked as a newspaper photojournalist for 14 years on stories large and small, local and international. He photographed people and events ranging from local high school athletes to national political conventions and documented the United States military interventions in Panama, Haiti, and Somalia. In 1997, while photographing in Sacramento, California, a gang of a half a dozen angry young men accosted him. Demanding his film, John was severely beaten, left for dead, bleeding on a sidewalk. His series, The Burden of Memory, chronicles the traumatic event and the long road back to recovery. In 2001, John began photographing in Mexico for his epic project, No Agua, No Vida, about the human alteration of the Colorado River. He has photographed along the entire 1,400 mile length of the river. Um, I met John a year or two after the attack. It's going back a while. <laughs> um, and every year since, I, I guess my admiration for you just keeps growing. Um, I think you will meet few photographers that are more dedicated to the medium and even less uh, who have a more compelling vision of the human condition. So please help me welcome John Trotter to the lecture series. Okay. So I don't do, I don't do this very much and uh, I don't know, I don't, I don't really know. I've, I've been to a few of these uh, presentations. Um, it's really great uh, presentations by some really great photographers, and but we're all we all come f uh, at this different from different places, and um, you know how do you describe a photographic life uh, and how to get there and. There's a lot that I'm not going to show you. Um, I can just say I, I fell in love with photography probably in high school, uh, you know, like everybody else who saw the m image appear on the magic paper, you know, in the dark room. That, that's what hooked me in, I think. But uh, after, at first, after high school, after getting out of high school, I, I did this sort of a detour because I was also a cyclist and I ended up going to uh, France for a while, living in France uh, and racing on a cycling team there and um, until I decided that I didn't really want to spend the best years of my life, you know, trying to be a professional bicycle racer and uh, so I came back and thought, well, what the hell, I guess I'll, uh, I'll go to this, this University of Missouri, which had a fairly well-known, oh, the first of the photojournalism programs, and uh, I then entered into a career in newspaper photojournalism, and uh, always wondered what, it, it always felt more like it, it wasn't going to be my entire life, and uh, uh, then uh, then, well, I may allude to it, to it and uh, I'll just play this and, and uh, well, I had this here. I, I was actually, <laughs> in my head, I was, I was going to be talking so you can look at this and sort of let it sink in. Um, but um, you'll see maybe what this means um, in a second. On the evening of March 23, 1997, as I finished a long, thoughtful bike ride just after sundown, I looked up to see the darkening sky flanked by the beginning of what would be a near-total lunar eclipse in the east and the frozen streak of the hale bopp comet in the west. The next afternoon was warm and lovely as I walked with my cameras through Sacramento's worn Oak Park neighborhood. 
searching for a picture for the newspaper in the clean spring light that dappled through the new leaves on the trees. Children were everywhere. But unlike most other days, this day went very badly, very quickly, though the memories of it are shrouded in fog for me. In my mind, I can still see a green 1970 Chevy Impala roar angrily around a corner and screech to a stop directly across the street from where I was standing. The light on Tarachi Golston, when he emerged from his car, was the kind of light I'd been looking for all day. He was screaming for my film, and then he hit me. During the part I can't remember, he and the five other accomplices who had me surrounded when he arrived kicked, stomped, and jumped on me, and left me for dead. Except I didn't die. Some time later, I came to understand that I was a resident at a quiet, pine-paneled brain injury rehabilitation facility called Sierra Gates. I couldn't walk. I stuttered, and my entire left side tinkled, as though it were asleep. I couldn't remember three numbers just recited to me by a speech therapist, and all the plans I'd made for the future seemed to belong to another life. I endured two and a half exhausting months of stumbling, humbling therapy there, alongside other equally confused souls with brains injured by car crashes, assaults, strokes, aneurysms. We all lived with a blank spot in our memories representing the events that had swept over each of us like a tsunami, drowning the lives we'd known. Six months after my release, still very cognitively and physically broken, I decided to return to Sierra Gates with my camera to try to learn to be a photographer again, to try to understand what had happened to me by observing the lives of those who were living in the first place I knew after my attack, to try to understand the blank spot. Thank you.
Okay. I never know uh, what it's going to be like to see him again. Um, interestingly enough, uh, I mean, Jaime asked me when I could talk, what date, and uh, I thought, okay, maybe March 28th. And uh, um, I guess I didn't think too much about it at the time, but uh, so March 24th was. Uh, the day of the attack, and, and actually, despite as bad as, uh, as bad as the attack really was, I was uh, out of the hospital fairly soon. And uh, so tomorrow would be exactly 20 days, uh, 20 years, excuse me, 20 years ago that I actually was admitted to Sierra Gates, and uh, uh, event which was, you know, really huge in my life uh, and which I I have no memory of at all and uh, I don't remember going there I don't I virtually remember nothing about the hospital and um, uh, so you know there I was and um, suddenly I wasn't you know I had been like most of you know, I'm going into to my work uh, every day, and I have things I'm planning on doing, and then suddenly I'm not. And, uh, uh, and my whole experience of the world is very different. And um, so what to do? <laughs> um, and how, and I, this, I guess this is about, this is a talk about photography, and not just about uh, being a human being, but sometimes they're not mutually exclusive. So I, my girlfriend at the time did encourage me. I says, you know, keep writing in your journal. So I thought, okay, yeah, I should, this is kind of, I should write about what's going on with me. And uh, then I would, I mean, my short-term memory was so bad. I mean, I was able to at least look at my journal and say, okay. So that really, I kind of remember that. So it really did happen. And um, eventually, uh, even though I, I wasn't really capable of photographing when I was at, there were, there were a few kind of pitiful attempts. Someone brought my camera to me, and I didn't even remember that they brought it to me. And uh, so eventually... You know, I I was released and and uh, still going back to Sierra Gates on uh, sort of uh, what do they call it? It wasn't work release. Uh, that's prison. I was that was a day client. That's what they called me. So I would come out and I my speech therapist one day said, "Okay, so can uh, you know I'd like for you to start taking pictures again and." Uh, you know, can you, do you think you can do that? And I thought, oh, yeah, sure, I think I can take pictures again. And, well, um, you know, what would you like to photograph? And I thought about it, and I decided that I would uh, see our gates. I would go there. Um, I, was, I was actually, uh, there was a big part of me, besides just the inability to photograph, there was a part of me that was actually terrified of being a photographer again because, uh, of photographing again because I had been attacked because I was a photographer. And, uh, you know, it was, it, it was sort of a really direct a attack on my, uh, the way I identified who I was. And uh, so, uh, but it was, I felt safe out there. It was, I knew that it was very, I couldn't deal with too many things going on at once. I still not so great at that, but um, um, so that's so I went out there and I started photographing. And how does it become, you know, this? I just kept going out and photographing. I didn't really have any plan about where I was, what I was going to do with any of these. It just felt like I was just photographing, 
and sometimes that's what we have to do, I guess, as photographers. And sometimes we have a plan, you know, a direction that we want, to, where we want to go. And other times, uh, you know, I never quite. I was. I was, I had never really worked on anything quite this long, and uh, so I was I was more or less an assignment photographer, but. You know, so and I'd never really photographed my own life so much, and I think a lot of photographers who aren't photojournalists, you know, it doesn't seem like an, you know, an unnatural thing to do at all. A lot of people photograph their own experience, but it wasn't something I, I really, you know, that we sort of did, and uh, so, I mean. And this, all this stuff. I mean, this is suddenly is part of my life. And, um, you know, uh, meanwhile, I'm out photographing at Sierra Gates, and there's this long involved there. It took eight months to arrest all the accomplices because all the people who were on the street were too terrified to be witnesses. And, uh, and uh, they arrested the main guy because he, they arrested him because he, um, on murdering somebody later in the same week, mm. and uh, so he was out the street, but all the juveniles were out there, and I, I wouldn't have known them if we were in the same elevator together. I wouldn't have recognized them. So I was, you know, I was afraid to be out in public for a while. Yeah, I mean, all this stuff became part of my life. You know, the, 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 this. I'm, I'm photographing at Sierra Gates, and this is sort of the backstory. While I'm out there, I'm having to go through three different trials where I have to be a witness, and you know, there's I, I forget how many thousands of pages of discovery for my case. It was, and you know, and uh, you know, it's it's not just me. It's my mom and dad. Every now and then I would, at the time, because partially because of my memory, my short-term memory was so kind of broken, um, and then the circumstances were so crazy. I, I remember I, I was in a meeting with my mom and dad, and I, I just got up and I took two pictures just so I, you know, it's, so I could look at it and believe that this was really happening, you know. So he's basically the the D, there are two. This is you can see the one on the one side and then the heaven on the left. Those were the two. They had two assistant DAs working on this, and you know they're telling my parents all the details of this stuff. And this is right before the trial started uh, for the main guy, and um, you know. And so I'm going. I don't know what to do with all this stuff. You know, there's, they have, there's an aerial map of the neighborhood where the attack happened on the wall. There's transcripts from prison phone, jail phone calls that the, the guy has made and letters. And he was on the same wing as the Unabomber, in fact, at that time um, in the Sacramento County Jail. And I'm just, so I'm photographing Sierra Gates and every now and then just sort of photographing. And actually, very, very few people have ever seen any of the, a couple of these pictures. They were just, I didn't know what to do. I didn't know what you're supposed to do. You know, what I didn't know what to do. So I just would occasionally take pictures of, and, um, of myself and uh, and uh, and th this actually was a picture from the uh, from Death Valley where I actually we're going there again. <laughs> Um, I had wanted to be. I wanted to go to Death Valley on the first anniversary uh, of the attack, uh, partially because I love the desert, and another part of me, I just wanted to be able to see everything around me, you know, because I was still 
very traumatized by the, you know, how quickly the attack happened. These people sort of came from somewhere under. I felt safe in some way just being out there and uh, being able to see around me. And, um, but this is kind of a segue, I guess. Um, you can see, I, you know, the big open sky. There was a sense of freedom somehow from all these circumstances that I felt trapped in uh, for, you know, well over a couple of years. And, um, and so eventually the trials were over. Um, about three of the juveniles were incarcerated. Uh, the main attacker is still incarcerated um, and not apparently living a really redemptive life in, in prison. And uh, um, though I hope actually he can at some point um, understand that would be good. And so I had been thinking seriously about moving to New York before all this happened. Um, and it's a complicated story, and I'm already probably running over. So, um, but so I, I did. I, I when I felt well enough, I about a, a year and a half after the, the this trial ended and everything, you know, that was over. Uh, I ended up getting a, a residency at Light Work, um, where was kind of a gift. I actually had something in my life to look forward to after the trial, which for the longest time was the only thing. It was just nothing past the trial existed in my mind. And, uh, and then actually during, I think, the jury deliberation, I got a call from Lightwork and they said, yo, you want to come up and have a residency? And I said, gosh, yeah, okay. And so I printed pretty much every Every day that I had the the ability to print, I printed these Sierra Gates pictures up there, and and, uh, and about a year after that, I moved to Brooklyn, <laughs> and I've been there ever since. I mean, what a crazy thing that was to do! But I wasn't going to stay in California. I just, I, you know, I didn't really have anything to gain by staying there. And I, I guess after you lose a lot, you just you think, uh, you know, what else can I lose? I, you know, like, what could happen? That hasn't already happened. So, and then the first thing I do, I, you know, I, I missed, I still missed parts of the West, and I had, I, and moving to California, I, I, I remember from Missouri, the first, the, there was this point where the rain stopped in April, and then it didn't rain, it rained at, at all. It didn't rain at all until October. And I remember the day it started raining, I actually walked outside in, into the middle of the street and stood in the rain. And I thought, how does this place exist? How, does, how, do, they, how do we even have this place? So I started getting interested in about water issues and how, you know, the incredible uh, gyrations we've gone through to uh, to engineer an existence in a very dry place and uh, and the Colorado River especially just captivated me and uh, because it's I, I think and it, so I, I read a, a piece in in a I don't know how many people have even heard of the high country news here but maybe you want to maybe nobody but I used to subscribe to it. It was about the Intermountain West. And there was a great piece about the Colorado River Delta. And I thought, that's where I should go. I'm just going to go there. And so not in a really willful way, but in some, I don't know, just I wanted to be working around the anniversary instead of just sitting there staring at the ceiling. And so somehow I ended up in Mexico. And the first day I started photographing, it wasn't a real plan. I don't know if I was really planning anything at that point, but so it turned out there I was photographing on this, the, on the, I guess the fourth anniversary of the attack, 
somehow I made it down there speaking very, very little Spanish. Um, so I'll just go into these pictures now. And uh, I mean, some of the people that I discovered right away were the Kukapa people who had lived there, and their name for themselves means the people of the river and their entire society, their culture and their beliefs were built around the way the, the river would run until, uh, until things started to change and Hoover Dam was built, you know, it was, it was such a cultural and, and engineering triumph for us to build Hoover Dam, but um, it's, imagine how the river dropped off for people with no television, maybe no radio, suddenly the river turned into more of a trickle as they're filling Lake Mead behind Hoover Dam in 1936. And these are people, you know, that I don't know if the, the, no one had ever built a dam like that. How could it, you know, you, you try and imagine what you would think living down in this delta. Um, that's the, he's now deceased. She was the oldest living Cucapa uh, Pascuala and uh, he, Onesimo um, has also passed away since I photographed this. And one of the biggest things that they do there, their, their main income, is uh, that they fish for uh, corvina, which is a sea bass. That, um, so it comes up to spawn up into the channel of the Colorado, which at this point is, is basically being, I mean, the river there the tide comes in, it raises 15 feet. And at, before the dams, when the, when, the, when the current of the river would meet the, the tide, the incoming tide, there's, it was incredibly violent. It could be, on a, especially on a, on a higher tide, it could be very violent in, in the springtime when the runoff was, was great. And uh, you know, there's stories about uh, white people coming up the river in boats and looking at these Kukapa people standing on the side of the rivers, you know, like, look at, look at how stupid they look. They're just kind of staring at us. And the Kukapa people are saying, look how stupid. Who would go up the river when, you know, the, like, are the tides coming in? Don't they know? That this is going to flip their boats over. And in fact, you know, that's what happened. A lot of people drown like that. Um, so, but they, they're, they're fishing for corvina um, around right now, this time of the year. And um, since things have, uh, there's so many dams have come in um, o over the years that about 95% of what was one of the great wetlands of the world has basically turned into a desert. And um, so they're kind of desert fishing. You can see it's just a, wasteland sort of behind them. This was all a wetland at one point. That's the chief's granddaughter, Media Luna. Um, and there, there's, so there's this biosphere reserve, you know, which is a great idea to try and save um, what's left uh, of the natural world. But these, these are the people, and I think it's, it's very common, people forget uh, that there are people living in these places and this is their home and so often they're not uh, consulted in any way about how uh, about the management of what's left and so these this is the chief's uh, daughter and and cousins and sisters all, it seems like all of the uh, the fishing licenses by in the Kukapa community are held by women, but she's being made. You can see the Mexican Marines in the back of the pickup. So they're basically making her sign uh, this acta. They're, they're saying, you know, you can no longer fish in the nucleus zone of the biosphere reserve. You're, you know, we don't care that there's only 300 of you left, and uh, and this is where your entire world was. You got to, you know for yourselves. They have no water rights. They don't even have land along the Colorado River. 
And uh, so, and this is, uh, yeah, I mean, it, this is down right at the mouth of what's left. I mean, anything that's coming down the Colorado River at this point is irrigation runoff because uh, as what's left of the river comes into Mexico, Mexico gets an allotment. Everybody gets a, there's seven states and Mexico, everybody gets their a set amount of water every year. And, uh, but right at the border, the Morelos Dam turns almost the entire flow of the river into these canals for irrigation. So there's almost nothing going down the main stem of the river anymore. And uh, so it's all just ir some irrigation runoff. The, the river itself doesn't even go to the ocean. It just sort of dies and then some irrigation water comes further down off into the old channel and that's about it. Um, and that's where I, when I first went down there, I, I, uh, that's what I thought I would do. I would just photograph the delta and I thought that that would be enough. And then the more I thought about it, the more I thought, okay, if I really want to explain what has happened here, I kind of have to explain what's happened north of the border. And, you know, that was kind of stupid because it opened me up to this enormous geographic area, not just along the river, but all the places where the river's water goes. Uh, this is up in Rocky Mountain National Park, kind of north and west of Denver, and that's really, that's, I mean, all rivers have multiple headwaters, but the one, the river that's called the Colorado actually starts there in Rocky Mountain National Park. And it's, you know, it's so different there. And still, you know, not, uh, everything is changing uh, with the river as well as everything else, but you know, all the things, and, and we have such a, even today's news, you know, we have such a triumph now that we've basically decided to, as a country, ignore global warming, uh, climate change, and uh, so nevertheless, the warming temperatures uh, mean that the, there's not as deep of a freeze in the winter, and the mountain bark beetles are able to survive, and lodgepole pines are being what, tens and tens of thousands of acres all over the West are being eaten up by these. And uh, you know, there's erosion. There's um, well, the river evaporates further down, but uh, I've, I'm sort of bouncing around here partially because I thought that these sort of we're together, but this is because of, I mean, this is what we've done with, with the water that starts up there and you stand in Mexico. Uh, this is Tucson, Arizona, and as you can see, it just goes on and on to the horizon. And um, essentially that was, it became possible for that to happen in, in the early 1980s when the Central Arizona water project canals was uh, finished. So the water goes from the Colorado River at Lake Havasu for about 300 miles out to uh, um, Tucson, goes to Phoenix, uh, which is only only 175 miles maybe from the river. And uh, of course Las Vegas um, is the closest major city to the river and they we're pumping groundwater somehow. I mean, that means sort of this Las Vegas, this, the springs, right, more or less. Uh, and uh, up until the Rat Pack era, and then they had to start getting water out of, the, out of Lake Mead, and now they're 90% uh, dependent on Colorado River water to have this, uh, you know, fantasy world out in the middle of the desert where you're going to have you know, your Venetian gondola ride in, in the desert. And um, where, you know, it's basically I've always thought it was sort of the, the ultimate expression of the American dream. You know, you sort of economize for prosperity, something for nothing. Um, you know, it's, it's kind of how we roll. 
And uh, you know, this is this is at the time this was a stalled out suburb going out into the desert, and they'd already installed the uh, sprinkler irrigation system, so there was <laughs> it was automatically just watering whatever, you know, just, it was it was crazy. It was like um, a sci-fi novel or something where these these sort of things that we built continued after our, we were no longer there or there was no use for them except this is before they were even used. And, um, you know, meanwhile, back in the, in the Delta, you have this. And this is because we want to build uh, what we built in the American West. You have a former wetland here. where it's, there's about two inches of rain a year. This is, I think this picture was taken in April. It was 108 degrees. There's so much of the, that's, that of the water is, is put into agriculture. Um, this is, you know, just south of the border in uh, Sonora, carrots, um, which would be right around this time of year, probably you know, you should see where your carrots are coming from. It's in the, in the winter, the Imperial and Cochea val valleys in Southern California, maybe 80, 90 percent of our winter vegetables come from there. And it's totally irrigated by the Colorado River. Um, and meanwhile, you have, I mean, it's affected everything. These are native fish that are in a Aquarium, there are so few of these left. These are bony tailed chubs that were, and they were evolved for the way the river was. Um, they would survive in muddy, muddy water, and then they had evolved to deal with flash flooding. And it's always indicative when all the introduced species, the rainbow trouts and German brown trouts, uh, when there's a big flood, say in the Grand Canyon, uh, which normally only happens now when they do a, uh, a simulated release of a, of a pre-dam flood. But all the non-native fish get swept miles down the river, and the only ones that are left are the natives. They just sort of tilt their noses down, and the water runs over their backs. And, and then in the, uh, in the more desert areas, um, you have these are desert pupfish, um, not very remarkably huge or, or, you know, colorful fish, but really amazing because they can survive in the mud even with no water for maybe a couple of years. You know, and, and, you know, what happens to when a wetland is gone, it is a place where birds, then Pacific Flyway, all the birds coming up the Pacific coast, they come up from the south, from Mexico, they have to have water um, at, uh, you know, on, on their route. And there's, there are very few places now for them um, to refuel. Um, Stanley, identify? That's a warbler. Okay, all right, sorry, sorry. All right, it's my bird person. Uh, of course, there are egrets everywhere. And down, uh, one of the things about the, that's happened with the flow being like it is, um, the, not, not only have the, have the lives changed for the animals, but the habitat, which also affects the lives of the animals. You know, it's not just water, but the way that the flooding Everything evolved, you know, like the Kukapa people, their whole culture evolved for this. The animals, you know, who were, have been there much longer, uh, they evolved, and the plants uh, evolved for, for certain conditions, and th those all changed. And so this is a non-native plant called uh, tamarisk, which anyone from maybe the southwestern U.S. would know, but it's taken over so many of the riparian areas all over the desert um, and outcompeted mesquite trees and willows 
uh, willows and cottonwoods are mainly right next to the river. And, you know, there are these, it's just everywhere and uh, along the river. And, you know, here, this is a little restoration project. And, you know, we're talking about everywhere, hundreds and hundreds of miles of Colorado River. And, and tributaries have this in it. So this is like a 200-acre restoration site, which is wonderful. And it's really come a long way. But you know, we're talking 200 acres in, the, in northwestern Mexico and southwestern United States. And we're not even close to Central Park there. But you know, there are still miracles down there. Uh, there was a, an air, a, a part of uh, Arizona that was put into irrigation in the early 60s. It was uh, Gila River water, which would flow into the Colorado. And when the irrigation runoff went into the, into the Colorado for the first year of irrigation of this area, it, the, it had been an inland sea, so there's so much salt in the soil. The water, the irrigation water, leached all the salt out, and the Mexican farmers started irrigating with what they were getting, and it started killing the plants. I mean, there was so much salt in it. So, you know, instead of saying, you know, the smart thing would be to say, you know, the Bureau of Reclamation, who makes all the dams, um, they would say, yeah, you know, this was a huge mistake. We're going to buy you out. This, you know, so instead, then, then, no, no, that's not how we do things. We're going to build a $300 million diesel plant in Yuma and, and so that we can continue to irrigate this land and, and basically grow alfalfa out there on hugely subsidized water. Um, and uh, but So they, they couldn't put this irrigation water into the Colorado while they're building this desal plant, they kind of built a canal out into Mexico in this old discrete hole in the fence, uh, the border fence, and uh, this kind of stopped. They said, okay, this looks like a good place to stop. So they stopped the canal, and it started, you know, all this irrigation water that started running into there, and it flooded these farmers' fields there in this little ajido, this cooperative village, and they were never really compensated. But it... It turned out it was the perfect salinity for cattails and tule marshes, and it's like the older people here remember tang, you know? It was like you just add water and you would have sort of orange juice. It's like you just add water and you could have a wetland again. I mean, and, and what, it, what it did was it was the first time people understood the potential for recovery was actually there, depending on how much you know we could get. You know, and, and until the water becomes so, I mean, they they ran the desal plant for about a month, and it was so expensive and such a huge energy hog. They said, oh, "We can't do this. You know, we wasted three hundred million dollars. We can't even run this thing." So they they mothballed it, and I guess waiting to a point where water becomes so valuable that they can. Uh, justify running it and at that point you know that's going to cut off this water source but and the native people <laughs> this is a on the Colorado R River Indian Reservation I mean you sort of get what's left you what's left after you build the first commercial wave machine in the world and in Temp Tempe, no, or is it Mesa, Arizona, in the desert? And that, this was an, uh, this another 105 degree day out there. This is um, Las Vegas, of course. Everything is irrigated, and uh, I was actually I, I started riding my bike to do this photography. After a while, I it kind of these parts of my life kind of got together again. I thought this is kind of an environmental story and and I'm out here, I'm already flying out here and maybe I should I'm already I'm renting a car and I could and and you know I'm thinking it especially nowadays as a film photographer and the way it slows you down, 
you know, especially shooting medium format film, have to reload every 10 frames. Um, uh, and so I wanted to see things at a more human s speed, which I thought, because of the breadth of this entire project, you know, the, the, the infrastructure, I thought it was a, a good way to see that even vast landscapes are only uh, just a collection of millions of little details. There's the, the, the granddaddy of the Mall of the Hoover Dam. There's uh, mostly Navajo people there. That's the Glen Canyon Dam and uh, Lake Powell in what was once one of the most, probably the most remote part of the United States outside of Alaska. It was a Labor Day weekend. It's a real Labor Day weekend kind of a place. The Grand Canyon, which I initially kind of avoided because it seemed too obvious. And then I realized that people don't understand. No, that, that's the river I'm talking about, the Colorado. That's the one that cut the Grand Canyon. So I got a trip into there and managed to get on a raft trip. I'm, I'm bouncing all over this vast area. This is the Salton Sea, which is totally full of, this is all Colorado River water. Um, it's all irrigation runoff. It has no outlet, and um, the salinity in it is far greater than the ocean now. There's only tilapia are the only fish that can kind of survive in there. Um, and it's a, I mean, it's a, a really fascinating story how it started. It all had to do with, you know, incredible hubris, but I don't have time to tell you that now, so <laughs> it's going to keep going. Um, so much of the river is agriculture. I mean, there's so many, lots going to the cities, more and more is going to the cities, but most of it is still outdoor use, agriculture. And I always tell people, whenever you buy your scallions at the store, um, and you see the little blue rubber band on them, you need to stop for a, a moment and meditate on how it got there and how a day starts at 4.30 in the morning for children and, uh, and goes until about sundown. And that's how your scallions are put together. That's the last little town. There's a religious festival down in the, one of the last towns in the Delta. This guy I've met on the first day uh, Juan Butron, really great, soulful guy. He's taught me a lot of Spanish and a lot of bad words um, that he thought would be useful for me. He did, um, he, there's this mesa near where he lives. He planted this mesquite tree and he goes out and waters it every day, you know, because it would die. Everything is Colorado River water there. As are his grandkids, they're doing the washing there. Um, one's in Mexico, and one is up in El Centro, El Centro, as they call it, in uh, California. Up by the headwaters again. And he's actually building, he and his pals are building a dam on, it's out of sand on the beach. Uh, asparagus, which you're probably starting to see in the stores. That's how you get it. Uh, that's near El Centro. That's all Colorado River. It's about 60 miles away from the river there. Um, and uh, there's no, it's actually below sea level at that point. So it runs downhill. That's the Cap Canal in Arizona. I mean, there are people just drive over these things on the interstate and don't really even give them a second thought, but it's how, this is how Tucson exists as we know it. And I'm going to sort of finish this, these pictures with this. I talked about the potential 
Um, there was this, this agreement that happened with, uh, it took years to put together um, uh, with environmentalists on both sides of the border, the U.S. government, the Bureau of Reclamation, the Mexican government, and there was some surplus water basically by people who were, had decided they weren't going to irrigate. So there was some extra water, and they decided that this year they were going to open up. This is the Morelos Dam. and I mean, the border, the U.S. border is right there on the other side of it. And um, they opened this, these gates up and put water into the main stream of the river, again, instead of going into the canals. Uh, uh, for the first time, and, and they wanted to see what would happen. And there were scientists were planning for years for this, and all kinds of instruments were put in, all kinds of, um, you know, bird, fish, uh, riparian habitat research was in place uh, to see what would happen and what the long-term effect would be. And as you can see, I mean, this is what's there. This, so the, the river, I was down there for a couple of weeks and just waiting for the river. And it would just, there was, you know, it was so dry. It just soaked into the dirt. It so, and this is all brought, all this dirt is from, you know, like the Grand Canyon. It's all this finely ground dirt for millions of years um, coming down the river. It, it, what, what did I have written down uh, about it? This is an amazing fact. For all the, that the Nile and the Mississippi are renowned for their alluvial deltas, the Colorado outstripped their ratio of silt to water by a factor of seven. On average, the river carried enough material to build a levee 20 feet high, 20 feet wide, and a mile long every single day. Put another way, any, in any given year, it could bear the entire Imperial Valley in Southern California under six inches of sediment. But, you know, with two inches of rain a year, um, and then the river, so it was just soaking in. So you're watching this, like, slow motion kind of flood because the water is, most of it's going into the ground, but then it's moving forward, you know, about, you know, six inches a minute, it seemed. You know, sometimes it was a little faster. And here, this is the same spot. I mean, just, just to the side of where that truck was. And this little kid had never seen the river there. That's, where, that's the river channel. He had never in his life seen the river. And for two weeks it was there. And then they closed up the dam. They put the water back into the uh, canals, and it dried up, and that was that. Here are people in uh, San Luis, Rio, Colorado. It's right on the border. The water came back to their city. Their city's named after um, St. Louis of the Colorado River. You know, and the, the, but there's it's just there's a bridge there over a dry land. There's there's my friend uh, Juan, the guy who who waters the mesquite. So he's waiting for the water to come down the river. He's sort of a funny guy, but he's sort of making, you know, he's waiting for hours out there in the sun. And eventually it came. Okay. I could go through, I'm just going to go through these really quick. So all this is film. I sort of jumped. That was, that was, that was the end. So that, that was, as I kind of forgot, that was the last of those Colorado River. And just so I've, I've been working on that. I don't know when I'll finish. Every time I think I'm finished, then something interesting happens. And I think, OK, well, i got to go out, and I'll shoot that, and then that'll be it. Um, so anyway, I'm going to just get, cycle through these. So I've been photographing the resistance. And then this will take about, I'm not going to linger here. These are the only digital photos that were taken in this entire. And these were all from the Women's March. Mm 
I'm sure you guys, they're out dancing in the street, and this guy decided instead of driving around, he would just drive his bus right through them. That was the, from here, the Yemeni bodega owners demonstration, which was, you know, this scary terrorist grandpa here. Just the, you know, it's, I love New York City. I love all the people here. Everybody I know is, is living in angst. <laughs> so I decided I would just was photographing this. So. That's, that's what I'm doing here locally, as I don't have to go all the way out to the desert. That's it. That's 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 it. That's enough. Uh, we have time for a short Q and A. I'll pass around the mic. It doesn't amplify your voice, but it's for wow. the video, so please use it. Eight o'clock. I did actually hit it. Yeah, you did. On the nose. <laughs> wow. I've never actually been on time for anything. <laughs> Hi, my name is Brooklyn, and I am a Hi. graduate student here with Katrine, getting my, uh, my master's in digital photography. I want to say thank you for being so brave to share your story with us, uh, of what you've gone through and how you've come to be the man you are today through photography. Um, one of the questions I wanted to ask is, through your journey, what was it through the photography that kept you going? I know there had to be days where you just didn't want to get up, you didn't want to do it, but the passion of photography saw you through. Um, can you recall a moment when that became clear? I, what kept me going? Uh, I mean, I, I guess I just, I was, I didn't know what to do. Um, and it was, I didn't know what was going on with me. Um, a lot of the time I didn't know why I, you know, I, I remembered this guy coming at me and hitting me, but then there's this space, and then there was this new experience of the world. And really, and it did, I had to go back, I guess, and I, I felt, I don't even know, I think it took about a year before I even figured out, I guess I'm photographing my own experience here, because all of these things that the Sierra Gates the stuff that I did myself, the therapy that I did myself, and and there was a photography really did. I mean that John Berger quote: "Photography relieves us of the burden of memory." I mean, I didn't. It when I it jumped out at me when I read it. I think I was actually living at Sierra Gates when I was reading it, and I thought, you know, I can look at this film, you know, a couple of weeks from now and I can understand that this, okay, this really happened and, and I kind of, I'm, sometimes it, I just forget things and then something reminds me and that's, and it's, it's quite amazing. Um, I, I thought that it would be great that photography could be used like that for people with brain injuries because it was a way of sort of uh, reorienting yourself, and I think that's, I guess I'm, I'm not really answering your question. I think that's what, it, what the photography was for me. It was, I was really closely observing these people, and I felt, you know, I didn't really even feel like a, a photographer. I didn't feel like I had, I was, I was part of a community of photographers anymore. Um, I felt like I was a community of people who had, you know, had these horrible things happen and had hit their brains and and that's who I felt most in common with and watching them in the way that you have to watch people to photograph them um, 
I think it taught me a lot about myself, and I think I, I didn't, if you had asked me that when I was doing this, I don't know I could have told you that, but maybe something in me understood that. So that's, and I was, and also, I, I just had nothing else going on in my life, you know? I mean, it was photography, it, it's, it felt like, it felt good to go out and, and felt natural to photograph again. It felt like something that I was searching for that I had lost. And, uh, and I, didn't, I didn't want to be afraid to photograph anymore. And, uh, and I slowly got over it that way. Anyway, um, that's a really long answer. For, I don't know if there's even an answer. I'm sorry if it wasn't. Okay. I was really intrigued by um, the comment you made about the bicycle and how you decided to start you know, bicycling as you were doing Oh, yeah, the, that was kind work. of like as a, an aside almost, right? It wasn't even... Yeah, can, I mean, can you give us a little bit more uh, uh, <laughs> you know, information Yeah, there's so that. much I could, you know, I'm, and I'm, I was really trying not to go over. So I, was, I kind of glossed over some things. It was, it's like, again, I don't really sometimes put a lot of... I'm not a very good planner. I wasn't a great planner before I got hurt, and I'm a really terrible planner now. And um, and I don't think I think things through a lot. <laughs> I don't, um, or I'd be finished with this project. And um, <laughs> but, but maybe and so so I decided. So I decided. Okay, I'm. I want to slow down and and, and you know. Uh, There, there was a, there, there's a, so I have this bicycle, okay, so it's got 20 inch wheels, it's about like a BMX, like a kid's bike, but it folds up, I found this great thing, you know, I bought it used on Craigslist, and it folds into a 31 inch Samsonite suitcase, so, <coughs> I mean, it's not like just, you got to kind of assemble some stuff, you know, there's some wrenching to do, but, you know, it's still, a, you know, it flies as a regular bag, and I get out, and then the suitcase, there's some smart people figure out how to, there's this thing that sort of snaps together with thumb screws in these three holes you drill in the bottom of the suitcase, and that becomes a trailer. So with like stroller wheels, that's what they, you know, you think, well, what can we use? Well, these stroller wheels we'll have for the trailer. And it snaps onto the back of this tr folding bike, and I just ride away from the airport or the bus station, or, and, you know, I've got, it kind of figured out how to carry my stuff. I've got sort of a backpack and a handlebar bag, and I carry a Mia 7 and 1, and Mia 7 with a handlebar bag, and, you know, and like all the film I can carry. And Kodak didn't even talk to me when they stopped making Tri X 320, uh, 220 film, and I used to at least get 20 exposures a roll. Now, you know, I have to carry twice as much because they're the same size, really. But so I, but it slows, and, and the, I mean, that's being a film photographer, those of us who are of that era, I mean, and especially the medium format ones, I mean, you just, I don't think I've ever shot, maybe it has, I used to have to shoot football games and things, like, I think I shot a Super Bowl once, basically so I could go to New Orleans. <laughs> <laughs> That's the only reason I agreed. And I, but I don't think I shot 800. Someone said, yeah, I shot 800, 800 frames. I think, man, I've never shot 800 frames. I don't know if I've ever done that in my life. And, you know, on a big day out in the Colorado River, I maybe shoot 200 pictures. That's like a big day. And all the gyrations, you know, to get out there and ride your bike around. And, you, you know, so you think you're slowing down. You're trying to think about what it is you're seeing. Uh, and what's important to photograph. So, and you know, I, f I feel that it makes, I understand the geography of the river a little bit more, you know, w in a more human terms, because it's, it's a really long river, and, w and we've kind of, you know, made it into this, you know, it's like a plumbing system, and it's not even, 
it's not real in a way. You doesn't we don't experience the geography in a real way. You know, we don't even the the places where we live out there, uh, they're not. So the, it was all to try and understand it better, and I don't know if it really has helped me. <laughs> I think maybe it has. There's a few things that I've I saw that I just wouldn't have seen in a car. I know for sure, like that four o'clock in the morning, that broken fountain and you know gushing irrigation water that no one else saw except for me because I was out on my bike at four in the morning going to Hoover Dam. I don't know, it wasn't that fascinating, was it? <laughs> It, with with these things like this water project, it's so many different things happening there, and yeah. it's so overwhelming. And um, yeah, it's so really kind of dumb of me. Like with I my mean, condition, you, you have you have a very unique perspective on this because you've kind of seen all these different aspects of it and talked to all these different people. Yeah. Um, do you see any hope there? Like, do you? And also, do you think that there's any practical things that like people can do to somehow contribute or help or? Um, I think I think. Actually, part of it, and again, I don't think I, I, you know, sometimes as photographers, the photographers will know sometimes you're photographing something and you see it later, you know, when you're looking at it, you're not even sure, you weren't even conscious about something when you're photographing it. You're not even consciously aware, it's sort of your intuition, but you saw that you were definitely, so that's, I think maybe the river, a lot of it was after what happened to me with my brain, I think a lot of what I understood about what hap what we've done to the river has a lot to do about perception and how what how we perceive you know what we've we're perceiving the river as this one thing that it clearly wasn't until the 1930s and uh, and we've perceived that we could have this whole outrageous civilization out there. You know, it's what, 30 million people? I've, I've heard up to 40 million. You know, I think it's arguable how many people, but a lot of people out there in Northwest Mexico and Southwest United States depend on the river. And, um, and you know, now that cli climate change is gonna accelerate, now that we're gonna be the coal nation, um, you know that it, all this water, like it, it comes out of Lake Havasu, which was that little blot of shiny reflective water at the corner. It's it's at the Arizona California border. They pump it over a thousand foot mountain and take it out to the California coast through one of the hottest deserts in the country. And it goes south of Joshua Tree. They've got to pump it over some more mountains, and it's evaporating all the way. And and Lake Mead. And Lake Powell, they're all evaporating. They're in very hot places. And, you know, there, there are computer models of this stuff. What's going to happen? You know, when just a few degrees, you know, not even a full degree and of, of, of annual mean temperature rise, how much more evaporation that's going to be? That's much less water for the people out there, which the populations keep growing. So I don't know. I mean, I don't see... Uh, you know, the first time since I started this project, it, there are people talking about, I mean, even the so-called water buffaloes, the water district managers, they're saying, well, you know, maybe we're going to have to decommission uh, Glen Canyon Dam. I mean, they, to keep water at an operable level above so-called dead pool, if you get down to a point called dead pool, it can't go through the, the, the power turbines, um, I mean, all kinds of dominoes start kind of falling. Uh, and you have to keep both of those lakes at that level. And to keep Lake Mead at that level, you got to take water out of Lake Powell. But, you know, at a certain point, there's just not, they're, they're in a, a drought now that has been going since 2000. And, uh, you know, a bunch of marinas on Lake Powell have been closed. And they thought, you know, seasonally, no, it's permanently. They're never going to open. I mean, the river has sort of reclaimed a lot of the back end of uh, 
of Lake Powell. You know, it's the Colorado River again. Um, um, but yeah, I don't know. I don't see a lot of hope. I mean, Las Vegas has actually done a lot for uh, uh, water conservation, but you know, there's a point um, I've, right now in front of everybody, I'm forgetting the term. I think it's called, it's called hardening the supply. So at a certain point, you keep conserving, right? And everybody's using soaker hoses, and, but that allows you to continue to grow at this rate, right? Because you're conserving, but then you have another drought and you're already, you've already hardened the supply. Then what do you do? You can't continue to harden it. I mean, there's, you can't conserve. When you reach the point where you can't conserve anymore, then you're really up against it. And I don't know. I mean, I've, I've joked, you know, I mean, call me an optimist, but I think that <laughs> it's a joke. Um, that, you know, that there's going to be a migration out of the southwestern U U.S. cities that's going to make, you know, Katrina look like a kindergarten picnic. I mean, I, I don't know how it's this is going to continue. Uh, you know, I mean, who's going to anyway? So I could go on. Okay. So no, not much. <laughs> But people disagree, you know. Thank you so much, John. Okay. For a wonderful lecture. Okay, thanks. I'd been looking for all day. He was screaming for my film. And then he hit me. During the part I can't remember, he and the five other accomplices who had me surrounded when he arrived kicked, stomped, and jumped on me, and left me for dead. Except I didn't die. Sometime later, I came to understand that I was a resident at a quiet, pine-paneled brain injury rehabilitation facility called Sierra Gates. I couldn't walk. I stuttered, and my entire left side tingled, as though it were asleep. I couldn't remember three numbers just recited to me by a speech therapist, and all the plans I'd made for the future seemed to belong to another life. I endured two and a half exhausting months of stumbling, humbling therapy there, alongside other equally confused souls with brains injured by car crashes, assaults, strokes, aneurysms. We all lived with a blank spot in our memories representing the events that had swept over each of us like a tsunami, drowning the lives we'd known. Six months after my release, still very cognitively and physically broken, I decided to return to Sierra Gates with my camera to try to learn to be a photographer again, to try to understand what had happened to me by observing the lives of those who were living in the first place I knew after my attack, to try to understand the blank spot Oh. Mm -hmm.
ich klagen, könnt ich sagen, irre sein an mir und dir. Nein, ich will im Busen Okay. <sighs> I never know uh, what it's going to be like to see him again. Um, interestingly enough, uh, I mean, Jaime asked me when I could talk what date, and uh, I thought, okay, maybe March 28th, and uh, um, I guess I didn't think too much about it at the time, but uh, so March 24th was uh, the day of the attack, and all the image appear on the magic paper, you know, in the dark room, that, that's what hooked me in, I think. But uh, after, at first, after high school, after getting out of high school, I, I did this sort of a detour because I was also a cyclist and I ended up going to uh, France for a while, living in France uh, and racing on a cycling team there and um, until I decided that I didn't really want to spend the best years of my life, you know, trying to be a professional bicycle racer. And uh, so I came back and thought, well, what the hell, I guess I'll... Uh, I'll go to this this University of Missouri, which had a fairly well known oh the first of the photojournalism programs and uh and then entered into a career in newspaper photojournalism and uh always wonder what it it always felt more like it it wasn't going to be my entire life and uh, uh then uh, then, well, I may alluded to it, to it, and uh, I'll just play this. And and uh, well, I had this here. I, I was actually <laughs> in my head. I was I was going to be talking, so you can look at this and sort of let it sink in. Um, but um, you'll see maybe what this means um, in a second. On the evening of March 23, 1997, as I finished a long, thoughtful bike ride just after sundown, I looked up to see the darkening sky flanked by the beginning of what would be a near-total lunar eclipse in the east and the frozen streak of the Hale-Bopp comet in the west. The next afternoon was warm and lovely as I walked with my cameras through Sacramento's worn Oak Park neighborhood searching for a picture for the newspaper in the clean spring light that dappled through the new leaves on the trees. Children were everywhere. But unlike most other days, this day went very badly, very quickly, though the memories of it are shrouded in fog for me. 
In my mind, I can still see a green 1970 Chevy Impala roar angrily around a corner and screech to a stop directly across the street from where I was standing. The light on Tarachi Golston, when he emerged from his car, was the kind of light Hello and welcome to the I3 lecture series hosted by the Masters in Digital Photography program at the School of Visual Arts. We're thrilled to have photographer John Trotter as tonight's guest speaker. A native of Missouri, John worked as a newspaper photojournalist for 14 years on stories large and small, local and international. He photographed people and events ranging from local high school athletes to national political conventions and documented the United States military interventions in Panama, Haiti, and Somalia. In 1997, while photographing in Sacramento, California, a gang of a half a dozen angry young men accosted him. Demanding his film, John was severely beaten, left for dead, bleeding on a sidewalk. His series, The Burden of Memory, chronicles the traumatic event and the long road back to recovery. In 2001, John began photographing in Mexico for his epic project, No Agua, No Vida, about the human alteration of the Colorado River. He has photographed along the entire 1,400 mile length of the river. Um, I met John a year or two after the attack. It's going back a while. <laughs> um, and every year since, I, I guess my admiration for you just keeps growing. Um, I think you will meet few photographers that are more dedicated to the medium and even less uh, who have a more compelling vision of the human condition. So please help me welcome John Trotter to the lecture series. Okay. So I don't do, I don't do this very much and um, I don't know, I don't, I don't really know. I've, I've been to a few of these uh, presentations. Um, it's really great uh, presentations by some really great photographers, and but we're all we all come f at this different from different places, and um, you know how do you describe a photographic life uh, and how to get there and. There's a lot that I'm not going to show you. Um, I can just say I, I fell in love with photography probably in high school, uh, you know, like everybody else who saw it. And actually, despite as bad as, uh, as, bad as the attack really was, I was uh, out of the hospital fairly soon. And uh, so tomorrow would be exactly 20 days 20 years, excuse me, 20 years ago that I actually was admitted to Sierra Gates and uh, uh, event which was, you know, really huge in my life uh, and which I, I have no memory of at all. And uh, I don't remember going there. I don't, I virtually remember nothing about the hospital. And uh, uh, so, You know, there I was, and um, suddenly I wasn't, you know, I, I'd been, like most of you know, I'm going into to my work uh, every day, and I have things I'm planning on doing, and then suddenly I'm not. And, uh, uh, and my whole experience of the world is very different. And um, so what to do <laughs> um, and how and I, this, I guess this is about this is a talk about photography and not just about uh, being a human being but sometimes they're not mutually exclusive so I my girlfriend at the time did encourage me I says you know keep writing in your journal so I thought okay yeah I should this is kind of 
I should write about what's going on with me. And uh, then I would, I mean, my short-term memory was so bad. I mean, I was able to at least look at my journal and say, okay. So that really, I kind of remembered that. So it really did happen. And um, eventually, uh, even though I, I wasn't really capable of photographing when I was at, there were, there were a few kind of pitiful attempts. Someone brought my camera to me, and I didn't even remember that they had brought it to me. And uh, so eventually, you know, I, I was released and, and uh, still going back to Sierra Gates on uh, sort of, uh, what do they call it? It wasn't work release. Uh, <laughs> that's prison. I guess. That was a day client. That's what they called me. So I would come out and I, my speech therapist one day said, okay, so can, uh, you know, I'd like for you to start taking pictures again. And, uh, you know, can you, do you think you can do that? And I thought,